Hello, this is Alan, welcoming you to the 2023rd edition of the Enfield Talking Newspaper. Date line is 22nd of October 2015. The readers this week are Jenny, Sonia, Roz and myself with Ian on the controls. The items that we will be reading come from our local newspapers, the Enfield Gazette and Advertiser, and the Enfield Independent, and are their copyright. Our title music is Country Rock Polka, composed by Pat Prie and Fernand Bouillon and Harry Breuer, and is performed by Jean-Jacques Perry. It's used with his kind permission. The local stories this week include Fury Over Nightmare Traffic and Pollution, Trainee Doctor's Anger Over Mad Contracts, Ward closure is raising concerns about further stripping of services, and a crook leads cops to loot. Um, I've got one little headline uh, of an item here regarding the RNIB, and then Jenny is going to read you the detail shortly after I finished. Um, just so you know, the RNIB gives tax advice free of charge. It's a free and confidential service that supports blind and partially sighted people with tax issues. If you're experiencing any problems receiving your Enfield Talking newspaper, please phone Diane De Jersey on 020 8805 6578. She is your listener's representative and will be pleased to help you. Now Jenny will read the details of the RNIB tax advice for you. RNIB has a free and confidential service to help people with sight loss with tax issues. RNIB staff can guide you through the tax allowances, benefits and concessions you may be entitled to and which products are exempt from VAT. The following is a summary of personal tax allowances available for the current tax year 2015 to 16. First of all, the personal allowance. The amount of tax-free income you can have in a year is called your personal allowance. The standard personal allowance for most people is £10,600. If you were born before the 6th of April 1938, you may be entitled to the age-related allowance, which is £10,660. And now the blind person's allowance. People registered blind or severely sight impaired can claim an additional allowance called the blind person's allowance. The allowance is £2,290, which can reduce your tax by up to £458 this year. You can transfer the blind person's allowance to your husband, wife or civil partner if you cannot make use of it all. Claims can be backdated for up to four years if you were registered blind or severely sight impaired during that time. The married couple's allowance. Married couple's allowance could reduce your tax bill by £835 a year if you're married and if one of you was born before the 6th of April, 1935. Marriage allowance. The new marriage allowance allows you to transfer some of your personal allowance to your spouse if you were both born on or after the 6th of April, 1935. This may reduce your partner's tax by up to £212. Tax on savings interest. You may qualify for tax-free interest on your savings if your taxable income is less than £15,600. It can be more than this if you get the blind person's allowance, married couple's allowance or marriage allowance. Further information. To find out what you can claim, call RNIB on 0845 330 4897 or 0151 702 5721. 
There is more information on the Government UK website at www.gov.uk. Junior doctors protesting against the government's plans to impose new contracts say they feel devalued and demoralised. Trainees from North Middlesex Hospital in Wilbury Way, Edmonton, and Barnet Hospital in Wellhouse Lane, Barnet, have spoken to the Times and Independent series about their concerns. The new contracts would see doctors who work between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Monday to Saturday paid the same as those working the normal 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. shift. The changes could lead to doctors taking a 15 to 30 percent pay cut and could abolish automatic pay rises after each year of training in recognition of experience. Sarah Tayabali, 28, works in the haematology department at North Middlesex Hospital and hopes to go into research. But she is now wondering whether it will be financially viable because she would end up suffering a pay cut. She said, people won't want to go into research and this could affect the next breakthrough in medicine. Morale is very low in the workforce. It's a complete slap in the face. We don't get much thanks for the work we do, and now we're accused of being a barrier. For a lot of people, this is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Patients will be at risk. Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt cites figures showing patients are more likely to die at weekends or in the evening as one of the reasons to create a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week NHS. Mother, Raina Popat, a GP trainee at Barnet Hospital, is expecting her second child with her husband, paediatric Dr. Priven. But the couple, who say they took out a mortgage based on pay increases, fear they could have to change their lifestyles. Mrs. Poppet, 28, said, People are demoralised. They realise they'll be paid less for doing longer hours. There's no longer an incentive to work antisocial hours. She also fears she may not be able to afford childcare as the cost is significantly higher between 5pm and 10pm. Nicola West, who is four years into her training at North Middlesex Hospital, called the situation mad. The 32-year-old said, We want people to know that if you need us at the weekend or in the evening, we are here and we will look after you. Doctors are at breaking point and so overstretched as it is, everyone is just about coping. You can't spread us any thinner. And then suddenly he says we aren't working hard enough. It's a ridiculous situation. Miss West fears there could be an exodus, putting people off becoming doctors. Lizzie Goodwin, 27, who has been training at Barnet Hospital for a year and a half, said... Our desire is to provide the best service we can for all patients. It's concerning that a lot of the public don't attend A&E at weekends because they don't think the care will be as good. That's not true. We need people to know that. A Department of Health spokesperson said, We have given the British Medical Association's Junior Doctors Committee four cast-iron assurances to encourage them to come back to the table and negotiate on a new contract that's fairer for doctors and safer for patients. Firstly, this is not a a cost-cutting exercise. We are not seeking to save any money from the pay bill. Secondly, the proposal will improve patient safety by better supporting a seven-day NHS. Thirdly, this contract will not impose longer hours on doctors. And finally, we will ensure that the great majority of junior doctors are at least as well paid as they would be now. We urge the BMA to come back to the table to work out the best deal for its members. Fears of further stripping of services at Chase Farm Hospital have been raised after it was revealed a learning disability centre will be moved. The Seacoal Centre at Chase Farm Hospital on the Ridgeway will be moved to the Kingswood Centre in Harrow. 
The hospital is undergoing a major refurbishment under its current owners, the Royal Free Trust. And the centre has treated people with learning disabilities for more than three decades. And news of its cl- many. Enfield North MP Joan Ryan told the Independent Enf- of Enfield that plans to move the centre and its patients would be a devastating blow to the borough. She said, I concerned at the prospect of further stripping of local health services in Enfield and in particular on the Chase Farm Hospital site. These are services that are much needed and there is no evidence that the need is decreasing. In fact, it is growing. The centre was owned by Enfield Primary Care Trust until 2008, when Central North West London Foundation Trust took over. And the trust claims only half the centre's beds have been filled and that the move is temporary. However, Miss Ryan was sceptical. She said, if, as they state, the move is temporary, then they should want us to have faith in that assertion and should tell us that the forward plan and dates for return of the service and where in Enfield it will come back to be based. How can they justify moving services to Kingswood in Kingsbury? These are community services for the people in Enfield. A spokesperson for the Health Trust said, We can confirm we are consulting with staff from the Seacoal Centre about a temporary move to our sister site, the Kingswood Centre. But since the Westerbourne View scandal, government policy has been to assess people with a learning disability who may need treatment in the community rather than in hospital. This has meant a fall in demand for beds, and in this case only half of our 12 beds were ever occupied. So a year ago we closed four beds and still have a unit of eight, though average occupancy is about 50% and could fall further. We have no proposal to close the total unit. However, the Seacole Centre is staffed for 12 beds, so we have six staff more than we require. On the other hand, our Kingswood Centre has vacancies, which at times we fill with costly agency staff. The consultation is for four to six staff to rotate to the Kingswood Centre to fill these vacancies, at least temporarily. And that would save us money spent on very expensive agency fees and the patients will have regular skilled staff to provide their care. The travelling time of transferred patients, perhaps 30 minutes each way, will be counted as part of their working day. We will listen to every point made before making a final decision. One of the men who has admitted his part in the multi-million pound Hatton Garden diamond heist has shown police where he hid his share of the hall in Edmonton Cemetery. Daniel Jones of Park Avenue, Bushnell Park, is reported to have been let out of Belmarsh Prison in South London on Thursday under armed guard to visit the cemetery in Church Street. Jones had contacted a TV news channel saying he wanted to help locate his share uh, from the raid on Hatton Garden safe deposit in central London. In a letter to the broadcaster, he said, I'm the only person in the world who knows where it is, deep down. I want to do the right thing and give it back. He added, If I don't get the chance to go out under armed escort, I hope some poor sod who's having it hard out there with his or her family find the lot and have a nice life. He was taken to the cemetery by flying squad officers with a police helicopter overhead, according to the broadcaster. He was accompanied by a team of police in forensic suits who excavated part of the cemetery, watched by a squad of armed police and Joan solicitor. The 58-year-old admitted conspiracy to burgle at a hearing at Woolwich Crown Court last month and is awaiting sentence. Jones was one of four men to have admitted their role in the heist over the Easter Bank holiday earlier this year. The others are Terry Perkins, age 67, of Heen Road, Enfield, Brian Reader, age 76, of Dartford Road, Kent, and 74-year-old John Collins of Islington, North London. Enfield plumber, Hugh Doyle, age 48, of Riverside Gardens, Enfield, is one of three men who who deny conspiracy to burgle between January the 1st and April the 7th this year, 
and money laundering between April the 1st and May 19th this year. They are due to stand trial later this year together with two men who have yet to enter pleas. A Metropolitan Police spokesman said, On October the 15th, officers of the Flying Squad searched a venue in North London as part of an ongoing investigation where property was recovered. Jenny. People living by a busy road have called for action after 30 years of nightmare traffic and pollution. Disgruntled residents gathered to launch a scathing attack on the non-stop gridlock in Bullsmore Lane, Bulls Cross. The road has constant lorry traffic from Enfield's industrial parks to the M25, leaving it as the most polluted road in the borough. People gave their views about how to improve traffic at a meeting with Enfield Council, Epping Forest District Council, Transport for London and the Greater London Authority at Lee Valley High School. Campaigner Rosemary Mehmet said, the traffic on Vosmore Lane is constant, 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. The amount of traffic means residents are seriously affected by noise pollution, structural damage to properties, health problems from air pollution and high levels of congestion on Bullsmore Lane and the surrounding roads. Residents expressed strong support for a direct access road to be built from Mollison Avenue to the M25 to ease traffic along Bullsmore Lane. Secretary of State for Transport, Right Honourable, right Honourable Patrick McLaughlin MP, visited disenfranchised residents in April and claimed the road would be one of his priorities if the Conservatives were elected. In July 2013, former Enfield North MP Nick Dubois met David Cameron's advisor John Hayes MP, who backed the Gateway scheme. However, Campaigners were disappointed not to see any representation from the Department of Transport or any action since the election. Enfield North MP Joan Ryan said local residents have campaigned on this issue for many years and got nowhere. I am determined they will be listened to. The meeting was very positive. We secured the full support of Enfield Council and it was great for the residents to have the opportunity to meet with a number of stakeholders who will be so important to resolving this issue. The Department of Transport has yet to make a comment. Campaigners calling for a full inquiry into the effects of hormonal pregnancy testing on developing fetuses have given a cautious welcome to the news that an expert working group has been convened to examine the issue. Primodos, which has been dubbed the forgotten thalidomide, was given to women in the 1960s and 1970s as a pregnancy test. The pills contained high doses of artificial hormones at a concentration 40 times higher than the modern day contraceptive pill. The pills were believed to work by inducing menstruation in women who are not pregnant. Chris Gooch, 66, of Carnarvon Avenue, Enfield, whose daughter Emma was born in 1971 with birth defects, which she believes were the result of being administered the pill by her doctor while she was pregnant, has been a vocal campaigner for a full public inquiry into the effects of the drug. When the all-party parliamentary group for hormonal pregnancy testing was set up last year, she celebrated the first victory in the fight to find out more about how much was known about the drug before it was taken off the market in 1978 after Shearing, the company who manufactured the drug, stopped recommending it for use in pregnancy testing in 1970. She was similarly optimistic when the government announced a call for evidence from the public as they were convening an expert working group to form a panel of inquiry into the effects of the drug earlier this year. However, she fears that the expert working group will only consider studies that have already been considered in earlier decades and will overlook new evidence. She told the advertiser, 
I'm concerned that the panel will not look into the evidence around the earlier studies into the drugs, such as why they were commissioned in the first place. However, a spokesman for the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory in Agency, which is responsible for the working group's inquiry, insisted that the remit for the panel was wide-ranging. He said, the expert working group will have access to all the evidence available to the government. The group will be presented with a detailed breakdown of all the evidence which has been collated and a detailed chronology of events based on the information available. A public call for evidence, which closed at the end of June, gave people the opportunity to provide evidence for the review. The group will be chaired by Dr. Elsa Gebi from NHS Lothian and will be made up of 27 doctors and academics from across the UK. A spokesman from Bayer, the company which took over sharing, said, Bayer is aware of the expert working group. We will be engaging with the review. However, while the review is ongoing, it would not be appropriate for Bayer to make any additional comments. Bayer denies that Primodos was responsible for causing any deformities in children. Former cardiac patients who attend a support group liked their 25th birthday celebrations quite a lot as they were entertained by Paul Daniels. The magician was joined by his assistant and wife, Debbie McGee, at a lunch at Bush Hill Park Golf Club to mark Hartthrob's Silver Jubilee. He entertained 70 guests with his tricks and involved a few volunteers from the audience. Hartthrob's was founded in 1990 by cardiac nurse sister Noreen Egan, who cared for patients in Melbourne Ward at Chase Farm Hospital in the Ridgeway Enfield. The club's honorary secretary, Joan Firth, said... In 1990, people who had a heart attack or heart problems were recommended to get bed rest. You would probably be in bed for quite a few weeks. Norin persuaded the doctors to try patient exercise, which was monitored very closely, and they found that they actually got better quite quickly. The success of the early sessions led to the start of a programme for heart patients in Enfield and a group got together to continue after their rehabilitation programme ended and to help them with the discipline of keeping up on exercise. Mrs Firth said, It was unheard of at the time and it was pretty new and it has gone from strength to strength. Patients are referred to the group by doctors to continue exercising with people who understand their concerns after they have completed their cardiac rehabilitation. It doesn't matter if you've had a stent or a heart bypass, said Mrs Firth. It's just persuading people that they can do it and they get used to the fact that they won't fall apart after surgery. Members who attend monthly cardiac support meetings where they have a chance to hear from a speaker usually on health-related topics. Speakers this year have included cardiologists as well as a talk on comedians from Jeff Bowden of the British Music Hall Society. The group holds six hourly sessions at Holt White Sports and Social Club in Holt White's Hill, Enfield, and one class at St Stephen's Church Hall in Park Avenue, Bush Hill Park. For further information, visit www.heartthrobs.org.uk or call... 01992-718-155 Thank you. A brave plumber who grabbed a dog which was attacking a police horse has been honoured with a top award. David Wilson from Edmondson was working in Greenwich Park in South London when he spotted the horse being savaged by a dog which was biting at his chest. His intervention has won him the Royal Horse Society's Sefton Award, named after the much-loved horse which survived the IRA, IRA bomb in 1982. The horse, called Quixote, was undergoing training, and police horse trainer Alistair Blamire said, David came running across from at least a 100 yards away and grabbed the dog. The quick-thinking 26-year-old held the French Bull Terrier cross to his chest to prevent it continuing the attack, and the dog's owner reattached its lead.
Quixote suffered puncture wounds in the incident on January the 22nd last year. The horse has since made a full recovery and is on duty in Whitehall. Mr Wilson, who works for the Royal Parks, was uninjured in the incident. He was reunited with Quixote at the Household Cavalry Barracks in Knightsbridge, central London, where Sefton was based, for an award ceremony. He was presented with a trophy and certificate honouring his bravery. He said, It's fantastic to see him out on the beat and doing so well. The award commemorates Sefton, who underwent eight hours of surgery after he sustained 34 life-threatening wounds in an IRA attack in Hyde Park in 1982. Enfield Southgate MP David Burrows staged a sleep-out to help raise awareness for homeless people. The MP followed the lead of former Enfield MP in 1967, Ian MacLeod, in Sleeping Rough for the Homeless. Unlike Mr MacLeod's candle-lit night at Hyde Park, Mr Burrows camped out at the Oval as he teamed up with charity CEO Sleep Out UK, which fights homelessness and poverty in London. The MP, who also supports housing shelters such as St Mungo's Broadway, called on the Prime Minister to lead a one-nation government by focusing on helping those in need. A dentist helped hundreds of Moroccan children on a two-day trip. Dr Keaton Shah, who normally works at Brightside Dental in Bounds Green, travelled to the remote Rif Mountains region in northeastern Morocco as part of the Dental Mavericks charity's Teeth for Life campaign. After treating more than 200 children last year, Dr Shah, 38, travelled with 14 dentists and nurses to help 342 children with dental pain in two days. Dr Shah of Crown Lane Southgate said, This was the most overwhelming experience of my dental career. We have now reached the end of side one of this tape. Please stop your machine now, take out the cassette, turn it over and start side two.